from younger generations, and a community of marginalized people who organize in the back of a bookstore to help drag their country into the future. End quote. Well, I thought this was wonderful. Let me give you a couple of reasons why, and then I'll give you the caveat that is the, the writing tip that I'm offering. You know, people often criticize romance novels. I don't know why they are the, the, the whipping child of popular fiction. I suspect it's because they're written mostly by women for women. Uh, you always hear people talking about trashy romance novels or a- a- acting as if there's nothing to it. Well, here's some books that have something to them that are clearly politically engaged. I might point out, in case you didn't know it, that very well-known politician Stacey Abrams has also written several romance novels under a pseudonym. So even if you think of this as this genre as being all fantasy and fluff, that doesn't mean there can't be some content of value or some takeaway for your readers. Are there dangers? Of course. My Daniel Pike series, which, you know, I'm wrapping up now with Final Verdict. Did I mention that? I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, anyway, the first book involved a young girl who's about to be deported. I won't go into the, the all the details. But I, I thought she was keenly sympathetic. Nobody wants to see this poor orphan sent back to her family of uh, sex trafficking cartel members, <laughs> regardless of how you feel about immigration. But, you know, go read the reviews on Amazon. Some people clearly saw it as being political and being anti uh, President Trump or pro-immigration or stuff that's not even in the book. Uh, do I care? No, I really don't. I think some writers have always engaged with the real world and there is nothing wrong with it. It doesn't limit its appeal. Since we're just past Christmas and you probably saw one, if not a dozen adaptations of A Christmas Carol, let me remind you that Charles Dickens always engaged with the real world. He was always the social reformer, and his books often led to real social reform. Did that hurt his appeal? I don't think so. He may be the most successful novelist of all time, and even today, when some of the things he wrote about, like debtor's prison, don't exist anymore, and some of them, like want and ignorance, thank you, Ghost of Christmas Present, still very much do, but the point is... More than 150 years later, those books are still widely read. They have heart that speaks to people, that really transcends the political and gets more to humanity and what kind of people we want to be. So here's my advice, Red Sneaker writers. Here's my writing tip. Don't be afraid to set your books in the real world and discuss real-world issues. You don't have to, but you can. But what I would caution you against is hammering your readers over the head with a particular political position, like acting as if you must agree with me, and if you don't, then you're just not very smart or something like that. Sometimes a tickling feather is better than a hammer. And always better to dramatize than to lecture. You should always acknowledge that there is more than one side to a complex issue. But bottom line, remember that if you've created a sympathetic protagonist, that protagonist's actions will have more impact than some lecture. So show them doing the right thing, the loving thing, the caring thing, and let that be the way that you influence your reader. I could not be more excited about presenting this interview with Steve Barry, the many, many, many times New York Times bestselling author of so many wonderful historical thrillers, especially since he's right in his wheelhouse uh, speaking about series characters in a time when series characters have never been more popular and represent such a brilliant 
potential way of breaking into the writing world. Here's what Steve has to say. Steve, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back again, Bill. I wanted to talk to you this time about series characters, because I know there's a lot of interest in series characters, a lot of demand for them. Uh, It seems to be uh, more of a popular way for writers to go than it has been in the past. And you, of course, with Cotton Malone, have one of the most successful series characters out there. Uh, But I remember you didn't start with Cotton Malone. You did uh, two, three novels, three. Before, three novels, and then with the Templar Legacy, introduced Cotton Malone. What what made you decide to create a series character? Well, it was really Random House's idea. Really? Uh, Mark Tamani, my editor at the time, said, let's create a series. And that was a little weird for me because I don't read series. I mean, I never really have read series. Now, I read Dirk Pitt, you know, Clive Cussler, yes. but those really aren't a series. Those are each kind of standalone books. Every one of them are standalone books. They just happen to go one after the other. Um, I wasn't a big series character uh, reader, so it was a little difficult for me to figure out how to do that. So we created Cotton Malone and wrote The Templar Legacy. And when I wrote it, I did not have any illusions that I was going to get to do this 15 more times. I was just hoping <laughs> to get through it you know, one time. So I, I, I created Cotton, mm-hmm. and he did very well, very, very well. I mean, as I said, that's my biggest selling book then and biggest selling book of all time is mm-hmm. The Templar Legacy. It still sells a lot of copies today. And Cotton was created, and so we, we kept him going. Now, mm-hmm. what I've learned And I learned this from Lee Child. He taught me this because he writes the Jack Reacher books. And each book in a series has to be the same but different. The same but different. Now, how does that how do you make that? That's a that's a tough that's a tall order now. So how are they the same? Well, there are every book is action, history, secrets, conspiracies. Okay, how is it different? Different history, different protagonists, different. So what's different settings. Everything about the book is different than the other. The only thing the same is action, history, secrets, conspiracies, and of course the character Cotton Malone. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've learned that trick. I write, I've written 15 Cotton Malone books mm-hmm. and I get asked all the time, do you have to write, read them in order? Absolutely not. You can read them in any order you please. I write them where you can come in and out of the series, however you want. And that's what I learned from Lee. Mm. The same but different. I mean, you're basically saying every book can't be exactly the same, but sort of every book needs to be the same, except in 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 different words, uh, and in different in different settings mm-hmm. and different motivations, right? All those kinds of things. I, every one of my books are utterly different, utterly different, but they are the same because they involve action, history, mm-hmm. secrets, conspiracy. Is it challenging to come up with those new fresh elements? Extremely challenging. It's harder and harder every year because I want something that no one's ever touched before. I don't want to do what someone's someone's up done. And I I'm it's hard. I have to find that thing from history, that thing from the past that's real. I cannot make it up. It's got to be real. And it's got to be something that's going to interest me and is going to interest the reader. And then I have to make it relevant today. It still has to matter today, that thing from the past. Mm -hmm. I call it the ooh factor, the thing from the past, the thing that kind of makes you go ooh, like Templars or Charlemagne or Mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And then the other thing is the so what. Who Mm -hmm. cares if we find the Library of Alexandria? Mm -hmm. Who cares if Queen Elizabeth I was a man? (laughs) Who cares, uh, you know, uh, about the Templars one way or the other. What does it matter? I have to have that so what today. Mm-hmm. And they're hard to, they're getting harder and harder to find. But thankfully, I'm okay for about four more years at least. <laughs> and then a new series character? No, no. I just have to come up with a new idea. Oh. I, I have, I have, I'm okay for oh. 21, 22, 23. I'm okay. Oh, you're saying you've got four years, uh, four years of ideas or stakes planned. Yeah, well, well, the 2021 novel's finished. It's already turned in because mm-hmm. 
you know, you do a year in advance in the book business. So I turned it in this year to publish next year. I'm writing the 2022 novel that will be turned in later this year. And then I've already got the ideas for 23 and 24. So as I said, I'm okay for four years. Hopefully within the next four years, I'll find a couple more ideas. I have a hunch you will. What what were the elements uh, or what were you thinking of when you created Cotton Malone? Copenhagen, used bookseller, uh, former was, government server. What, what, what were you trying to do there? Uh, how are you going to make him appealing? Well, I wanted him to be different. You've got to create somebody a little different. Mm-hmm. So I was in Copenhagen when he was born. I was in I broke plots, which is a square there. I was eating at the Cafe Nordon, and there I was, and he came into my brain. Uh, He's going to be a retired Justice Department agent. He's going to own an old bookshop. Because you love (laughs) old bookshops, right? Bookshops, yeah. And he's going to uh, uh, be get himself into trouble all the Mm -hmm. time. And he kind of came into my brain and I wrote down the elements of what he should be. And I went back and I wrote the Templar legacy and created him. Now, the, what I wanted from him, he's not a Daniel Craig kind of guy. He's <laughs> not. He doesn't work out every day. He doesn't run 20 miles. He doesn't bench press. He, he's an ordinary guy who can do extraordinary things when called upon. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why he's kind of caught on because – He's not a superhero. He makes mm-hmm. mistakes. He screws up, but he fixes it in the end. You know, you mentioned Daniel Craig, a James Bond actor, obviously, but it occurs to me that in the early Ian Fleming novels, James Bond is much more ordinary, even talking about how boring he is in real life, but rises to the occasion. Uh, right. that, that's, that's where I, a lot of, some of that came to me from reading those early Ian Fleming novels. The James Bond of the movies and the James Bond that Fleming created originally are not the same character. Right. Especially uh, in the early the, novels. Right. And because the best spy is the one you never notice. Which That's, makes a lot of sense. Who would not right. notice? <laughs> <laughs> and I assume Cotton was a former government agent uh, because that gives him skills. Even if he's not working out every day, he can't handle himself. If he needs I had to. to. You have to have that element in there. But I made him retire. So he, he quit it early and he moves to Copenhagen, divorces his wife, moves over, owns an old bookshop, and just kind of gets drugged back in all the time mm-hmm. against okay. his will. Yeah. But he, you know, and so, and, and I use those personal motivations for a lot of books, but hell, about eight or nine books in, you just run out of them. So I had mm-hmm. to transition him over. And now he basically works for hire. Right. Now, speaking of not being James Bond, uh, Cotton is very successful, you know, professionally dealing with the bad guys, but considerably less so in his personal life. Was that a deliberate choice? Yes. He's terrible with women. Terrible. Mm -hmm. He's he's not good with it at all. He's divorced from his wife. He has a son that's not biologically his. Mm. Um, he has to deal with that. That's dealt with in several of the novels. And he, uh, he has a father that he, that died when he was age 10. And that was dealt with in the Charlemagne pursuit. Um, he, and, and then he, he meets Cassiopeia. And in the beginning, Cassiopeia was not supposed to be really a love interest for Cot. He was, she was just kind of, kind of come in and go out, but she stuck around and she's there now. And now they have a relationship and they, and she's become a very popular character. And when I don't put her in a book, I catch hell for it. <laughs> she was introduced, am I thinking right, in one of the short stories? She was introduced in the uh, in the Templar Legacy. Oh. When she, I actually introduced her there, but she was a kind of a – she was not a major player in that. Okay. Uh, so I, I wasn't going to keep her, but uh, Elizabeth, my wife, said that that wasn't an option. So she had to stay. So, because Cassiopeia is basically her, ah, so she wanted she wanted her to continue, and so she has. And now, I actually broke them up at the end of one of the novels. Um, I actually ended their relationship completely. And she had read the, the the she's the first reader of my manuscript when it's finished, and she read it. She came in, she threw it on the table, 
And she says, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, she just, 